speaker, millions of women around the world go to churches on Sundays or Saturdays, and they hear sermons telling them that they're inferior compared to men. They hear sermons saying that they can't hold positions within churches, all because the Bible or their religious scriptures tell them that that is the case. They're taught to be second-class citizens. We think that the essence of today's debate is essentially arose around this important question. If women were to truly liberate themselves and to pursue career paths, or to pursue ideologies or conscious beliefs that they, based on their own conscience, is that compatible with elements of organized religion? And on our side of the house, what we're going to show you in today's debate is that the more you protect organized religion, the more you subscribe to the belief of organized religion, it's impossible to truly liberate yourself as a woman. And at the same time, if you want to truly liberate yourself as a woman, it makes it impossible to follow the religious doctrines that organized religion provide uh, for you. And in this sense, I have three arguments. I'm going to first tell you what the general characteristics of organized religion is. Secondly, I'm going to tell you as to why this goes against women's liberation. And finally, some analysis as to why it's impossible to coexist. But let's go into the general characteristics of organized religion. I want to first define and characterize what organized religion is. So we want to like now down to a couple of things. Like for example, like Catholic Church, Christianity, is Islam or Judaism, and even including Buddhism, right? The major organized religions that we have in our society. So three analysis here. Firstly, we think that organized religion is essentially institutionalized by religious authority. So we have the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, who speak on how to interpret it, these kinds of uh, textures and whatnot. This is very different. Individual faith, right? It's different from me individually leaving what the texture means because institutional organized religion basically it means that there's an authority who gives you that interpretation. Secondly, organized religion applies strict and rigid interpretations. The reason is because they have things like a religious doctrine that they have to follow, they have canon law they have to follow, they have a text that has not changed for centuries which they have to follow which is why they have to apply strict rigid implications based on these characteristics. Thirdly, there's a principle called the doctrine of infallibility. And we think it's extremely important in the sense that they teach their believers, their followers, to follow their interpretation, to not question the authorities, to not question what the Pope says, that they have to take it based on faith, not based on reasoning, not based on their personal uh, selectivity, but based on what they tell you. That principle of doctrine of infallibility is an essential component of organized religion. And we think this leads to two important characteristics that, uh, within society. It forces upon certain lifestyles, or certain lifestyles based on that organized religion, customs that women have to follow, right? They have to subscribe in order to be faithful to their own religion. And secondly, society creates moral codes based on these, especially in extremely religious societies. So we think that with this organizing, uh, characteristic of organized religion, I want to go into my second point of analysis, which is whether organized religion is an anti to women's liberation. And we say yes. Here, I want to first analyze what women's liberation means. As I said before, we think that women's liberation means that you as a woman are able to do what you want, not being bound by any, any social stereotype or social expectation. So in other words, you will be able to freely pursue the things that you want to do, not being bound, not having that clash with any particular other value that you also hold dear, right? In this sense, we think that religion and organized religion presents an assault on women in many different ways. For example, chapter 1444, for instance, Simply, so don't ask me how I know, but here it says that women should be silent in churches, Madam Speaker. It says that women aren't able to hold important positions within the church because they have to be silent in front of the public and whatnot. Secondly, it also states that women should be subordinate to men in many religious scriptures. So thank you. Especially when it comes, that's why uh, the religious, religious organization often enforce extremely subordinate roles that women have to be in the household and you know, support their husband. Thirdly, it also supports things like women, men should like, beat their wives, right? Whenever they are, it's unsupportive, it's like things like this. Premarital sex for women, for example, is not okay. Like they also have special dress code. Women have to cover themselves up because they arouse men, right? These kinds of gender stereotypes are heavily supported by the interpretation of organized religion. We think that these generally, 
provide a, provide a gender unequal kind of lifestyle that individuals have to follow if they want to stay faithful to organized religion. So in this sense, we think it's extremely problematic. Yes, Instead of explaining in some extreme context why religion looks like that, tell me why there is structurally no chance of religion progressing when we are seeing so much progress in religion. Uh, maybe I should have put that here, but <laughs> I decided with NC to put in my last argument. So please be patient. Okay, so having that analysis done, we tell you that organized religion presents an assault on women. So let's go into our final point as to whether it can coexist or not. And I think this point will directly address the point of information by that woman, uh, lady over there. Firstly, we say that true woman's liberation, for example, let's say you want to do abortion, but nonetheless organized religions tells you that abortion is not okay. In order to like truly liberate yourself in these kinds of ways, that would be the direct violation of your religion, right? organized religion, but at the same time, if you follow organized religion, that means you can't afford a child, and therefore, you would not be able to truly liberate yourself. So we think that, in this sense, there's an incompatibility. The more you strive to protect organized religion, the more possible it is for you to truly liberate yourself. But secondly, and this addresses the question of change, whether organized religion can change or not. Number one, we think that Organized religion has to interpret uh, their interpret the Bible or whatnot based on the text. And the text of the Madam Speaker does not change. It has not changed for centuries. And it st states there that women are subordinate. It states there that women cannot hold these kinds of positions. So it's impossible to change organized religion because you would have to change the text itself, right? But the text that by definition is the word of God, which means that you can't change the word of God based on what you want. Be. The word of God is simply there, and it's simply there to follow. But more importantly, the more we change organized religion as they propose, that means they're losing your identity as an organized religion, Madam Speaker, because you're altering the text of what God actually delivered. In that sense, that's why change, if there is any, would not be to a point of liberating women, but would be only within the confinements of imposing women the same kind of subordinate uh, structures that women have to subscribe to. Finally, we also say that when it comes to democracy, uh, it's not a democracy, right? Women are not being able to be elected and they cannot change religion in this kind of way because they have a structure where people constantly rotate amongst themselves to continue that interpretation. In this sense, we are very proud too. So we think 
think that even if we don't, if we think that even regardless of religion, this debate shouldn't it shouldn't be about whether or not we have true liberation of women because we think that even regardless of religion, we don't have true liberation of women yet. But we think that sooner or later, as society is progressing right now in status quo, we think that religion will also sooner or later reflect the true liberation that women want in status quo. Thank you. Let's go on to a couple of rebuttals before I move on to my arguments. Because the whole idea is that they say that religious groups, they have leaders, they have pope, and this gives them interpretation of what they want to have. Which is kind of weird, because at the same breath, they tell us that they have the same Bible and they constantly put down that kind of belief. Which is weird, because religion in itself is an interpretation of whatever leaders stand up in the first place. Which already means that it's different from pope to pope. That's why right now, you have Pope Francis, who is more oh, open and more liberal to things that about the LGBT. And probably he's going to say the idea of Pope Francis still being sexist. But the point is, no. we're still more progressive in the voices that these popes have in terms of the inter interpretations that they have. But then secondly, the main faults that they have in terms of Bible is that the Bible has never changed. It's absolutely not true. If I were to tell you how many, how many times the Bible has been translated, has been revised, has been added, is more than 6,000 times from thousands of years ago until now. That's why you have different subsidiary Bibles. That's why you have the Protestant Bible, which neglects a lot of yeah. Old Testament books. You know why I know this? Because I was a hardcore be believer and now I'm an atheist, so I used to read the Bible all the time. So the point is, even yeah. if that were true that the Bible was constant, do you have any religious popes or leaders stoning women right now or shaming them actively yeah. for them having divorce? We don't do those things. In the past, the Bible said that if you have sex with a woman who is on the period, they would cut them and they would stone them. We don't do that anymore. Like, I don't think it's ever fair for you to say that we always reflect the Bible. So even under the first case, it's not the way that we interpret that, um, which is not true, right? So I'm going to go on to my arguments now, so I'll really explain um, other responses. The first idea is that, why do we think that this is an incentive for religious groups to coexist in the first place? Because what you have to understand is that there's a huge interest for these religious groups to garner believers and to garner people in the first place. The main reason why they're organized is because they come up with a liberal, uh, the democratic kind of group where they have voting systems, where they have the idea of influencing, the idea of them having missionaries and going to places. You have to understand that my school when I was in high school was made by missionary nuns who decided to have a vision of empowering women. So these days are for educating different kinds of sex, no matter how um, sexist or no matter how like conservative their states may be because their value is for having like Christianity and having the value of love and all of these faithful things. So we think that all of these missionary groups and all of these religious groups have all that incentive to do so. But then what you also have to understand right now in status quo is that the interests of these believers and people have changed to a trend, i.e. you're more open to criticisms, i.e. you have trends of feminist icons and celebrities having, um, showing that you have to be a feminist or showing that you can be a more liberal woman. And if that happens, it means that we have more liberals and progressive people having in the first place. So now, the way religious groups calculate their, um, their way of thinking of garnering believers also shifts in the way that interests people. So if ever they want to have, if ever their main goal is to passing on more disciples, which is what Christianity is, really is for, obviously their main incentive to, is to calculate what is the best interest of these non-believers or believers in the first place. So if my media tells me that I have to be a feminist icon because I love Taylor Swift or I love, like, I love um, Beyonce, obviously I want to make sure that the church that I believe in also reflects me in the first place. And churches don't want a huge, massive, modern um, society leaving the church in the first place. That's why they have a huge incentive to keep them there because that's also a reflection of the culture that we have right now in society. So in conclusion, right, we think that we have moved on. We think that just because the Bible supports slavery in the past or stoning women doesn't mean that right now the status quo of how religious right. organizations function doesn't mean that they stone women or they continuously support these things because they know that when civil rights movement existed, when all of these progressive people have yeah. gained criticisms, it's not something that's beneficial or good for the way that the UK want to reflect or view their religion in the first place yeah. because it's not good. But what we also have to understand is that we have different subsidiary groups and religions. That's why we have Protestant groups. That's why we have pastor women now in these Protestant groups because they know that that's more liberating for them. So it's not just an extreme example that governments want, want to depict, depict right? We have, uh, like my church had a woman priest who was able to actively voice out these things because they know that they can coexist while believing in God and having an empowerment for these women in the first place, right? So debates on abortion and divorce, we have to understand that these are debates still that are still going to exist regardless of religion because the debate was about pro-life or whether the life exists in the first place. So that, that reflection will still exist coming from their side, right? But then lastly, right, why do we think that there's a power structure that we get to um, take away in the first place? Because when I told you about benefits to garner or incentives or motivation, the analysis here is that when they realize that women are economic forces that are extremely beneficial for churches because you give your money or you give 10% of your income to the churches already means that they want to make sure that these believers are able to benefit from 
from them because they know that women now, we have more women leaders or we have more political um, power for these women because they want to make sure that they are still in the voice or they are still in the huge influence for these religious groups. I.e. the idea of Christian missionaries actively giving um, education to African countries or have, maybe, uh, having the understanding that leaders are more educated elites now in Santa School who understand that as a progressive Western democ democracy you have to have the empowerment of equality and all these things. We think that religion can coexist at a sooner or later time in terms of empowering both sexes for extremely powerful things. quite relevant to the 
Hey, because wait, wait, wait. religious people is not going to say, because I love women, that is why I accept your freedom of choices. They always say, because I trust and respect the word of God, that is why I don't like you to kill your babies within this world. Yes. Well, unfortunately, it comes to poor life thing. See, it depends on how you interpret what life is and whether you accept it as life. Therefore, if religion has an incentive to accept women and liberate women, we think therefore religion will change its interpretation into believing that abortion is in the world of God. This is a reason why the women should listen carefully, right? We think that's wrong. When, you know, we says we need more female. That is why we need their money. That is why we must change the religion. The religion is losing their original meaning. I gave you five times, but there wasn't any responses. I don't think they want to listen to my voices and my, you know, religious like the scripture reading that's the problem, right? Then they said there is a missionary groups so the, 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 the to respect the female right, that is why they make the schools. No, that's not the case. They make the schools because they want to spread the words of God and they want to say the religion is way more important than you and your people and female themselves. That is the purpose of making a schools. Rather than I love female, that is why I'm making the schools and you can't you know, go against right of the school. Wait, those kind of schools have a strict rules, right? They must have a religious like types of activity, they shouldn't have a sex before marry, they shouldn't see the porn, they shouldn't masturbate themselves. If I made the schools and that school said you shouldn't be free from every you know, religious sense and then you shouldn't rebellate from the religion, then I don't think that school is helping the rebellation of you know, female, right? We think this is the problem, right? So we think that the second speaker should deal with my first speaker's point and my point. Why changing the religion is not losing the meaning of religion, right? More than that, they said we have many, many female, you know, like there's a priest. That is why we see the religion is changing. No, that's not the case. If I in the in church and then if I subordinate the certain religions, and that religion said you shouldn't, you know, recognize as a female, and then you shouldn't respect the books, which says it degrades you. We don't think that is the true thing, and that gives a lot of value. Let's move on to my last question. Why their policy cannot have the true liberation of female, right? Because we think that true liberation as a female has a duty and a responsibility. I have a great you and them and then everybody. But the problems of their case is because a female who trusts and believes the religion, we can't liberate every female, right? We don't think this is a true liberation because I trust, I believe the Muslims, that is why I want to wear hijab. You want to be that you you want to be inside of that community, that is why you are giving up you as a female, but you follow the concept and custom of that religion, right? That is why you can't have 100% reparation of a female. But more than that, we think that female should accept it by the males too. But problem of religion, if I am the Christian, and I'm going to always say, I can't be a feminist because feminist and religion have a different idea. That is why they always fight, they have always conflict. That's why they, they always have a different ideas and different concepts. We think that when female cannot accept it by the male, you can say there is a true liberation of religion. That is why religion and true liberation cannot be compatible. Madam Speaker, this debate is about true religion and true liberation of women. When they don't accept the meaning of religion, when they say degrading religion itself is the good way to go, we don't think there is a compatible. We think there is a killing one part and then respecting other parts. That is why we are strongly proposed to this. Right? The burden of population today is this, is this. If you read the motion, it's quite simple. 
simple and clear. It's that you have to prove why structurally organized religion can never achieve and coexist with women's liberation. And the burden is quite high if you look into what this actually means. Because proposition has to clearly prove to us why religion exclusively does to oppress women. This has to do with not reflecting the society or if they are just argued that because the society looks like that right now, religion is reflecting it or religion is doing it right now so religion is maybe going to change but maybe there's higher possibility not going to change. They're not fulfilling their burden. Why? Because they're never exclus exclusively telling us why it is always in the problem of religion that it will never change when we've already given you so many counter narratives against how religion changed and how religion accepted different interpretations when they're simply arguing, no, in some parts of the in some parts of the world, religion still didn't change. No, you're not fulfilling your burden because we told you that in many parts of the world, religion has changed and the religion is having a trend to change. And therefore, you have to rebut to us why there's absolutely no possibility of these religion changing. We have simply one answer to this coming from population, right? The simple one answer is this. It's written in the Bible and therefore you cannot change it. And people are always going to believe what is directly written in the Bible. Our answer was very simple, but still we see no engagement to this answer. Our answer was this basically. Hey, there are many, many different types of how types and versions of Bible to begin with. And always as religion progressed, we saw different Bibles becoming the mainstream of organized religion. And we think therefore, we have seen churches disregarding what was in the most orthodox form of church to begin with, what was in the most orthodox form of Bible to begin with. They were preaching about how people don't have equal rights, or they were preaching about how women should be stoned, or how premarital sex is something that has to be stoned. But we don't no longer do that because religion recognizes that it's not in the instant they were to do so. And their Bible, the Bible, the original text that they use, have also changed because we have like 60,000 versions of Bible existing in our world, Madam Speaker, and in the end, it becomes a religious choice for which version of Bible they're going to obtain, which version of Bible they're going to strategically choose so that they appeal to the major society, they appeal to expand their power inside the society, like get more money from more powerful people inside society, whatnot. But before I move down, yes. You said there's so many versions. Give me one example of a Bible version where Christians say that women should not obey their husbands. The point is, it is going to change. The interpretation is going to change. The Bible is going to change and we're going to have new versions. That is the point. That always Bible versions have progressed in the in the way it is written and the, in the way it is interpreted. So my point is, basically tell me why there is no chance of people changing the interpretation of what is inside the Bible and changing what is actually inside the Bible. Because always it is a problem of how you translate the original text and what you actually carry on to make it a modern version and carry on to a modern scripture. And we are, we, we are happy to propose, I'm happy to propose the idea that religion has an incentive to do so. No sir. Okay, let's move on to the second point, right? The second point is this. We see an awful concession coming from the government side. Government side says this. Yes, religion changed. We accept it. But they think it's against the real religion because they have moved away from real religion. What the hell is real religion to begin with, right? Because reality means, by dictionary, reality means what it exists in the world right now. So if organized religion exists in the form of a changed one, that is the real religion, not the version that we had a long time ago. If you are to just argue that long time ago we had real, real religion, but what we have right now is not real religion, real, real religion, so we defend the old religion, and old religion really didn't defend women, no. but now real religion is old religion, so therefore we win the debate. You're not really doing the debate because that's not reality, that's called history and past, right? And before I move on, yes. Okay, if the religion forced by society and they should give up their script, but they must accept the constitution, and they didn't accept the constitution other than script, then do you think there is a real religion? Yes. Yes, we think that's real because that's how it exists in your world right now. Reality means not in your dreams, not in your dreams of past. Reality means how it looks like now, looks like right now, and what it is going to look like in the future. So we think basically when they say real religion doesn't do that, real religion doesn't do that, that kind of sounds similar like real men don't do it, but anyway, <laughs> the point is basically reality means how the religion looks like right now, and if the religion compromised the society's value, the religion became more modernized, we think that is the real belief of the religion right now, and we have to debate about that. Now let's move on to the third part about how like, females can never be accepted within religion because males are always against feminism, males are always against women liberation if they're always inside religion. The idea is this, we think basically as the society becomes more and more modernized, there's more and more secular forces that affect the believers as well. We think basically, like, let's look at church believers for example.
example, they go to church on Sunday and listen to preach, but from Monday to Saturday, they're always in the secular society listening to different narratives from the secular society, right? So if, even if you are a male, we think there's high incentive for you to buy into the counter narratives coming from the secular society. For example, what the school tells you, what your school teachers tell you, or what your media tells you, even if you are a male, we think basically there's high incentive that you have a lot of exposure to the counter narratives coming from the secular society. And if the society becomes more and more modernized, we think these people raise skepticism, raise criticism, and raise doubts against the preachings that are delivered by the priest. So we think basically you lose more and more faithful believers who believe in the real religion version that you're talking about. Because people have more and more exposure to the counter narratives, more modernized version of narratives speaking about women. So we think basically when you say males are never going to accept females just because they believe in church, we think that's wrong. Because men, the only source of narrative coming to them in life is not church, but they have very different channels of narrative coming to them. Let's move on to my last point, the extension I'm going to bring as the deputy speaker. We think basically as the society moves on and on and becomes more democratized and modernized, we think the society becomes more and more secular. Why is that so? Because basically we think religion means, like organized religion, used to mean that there is high authority centered to one person, but if the society becomes more and more democratized, there's more and more movement to give you know, less power to one single authority, but rather to spread power among like different common people, right? So basically, we think the idea is this. There's more and more forces to be secular in the modern society. There's more and more narrative about how people are equal. The idea is this. Therefore, if the society becomes more and more secular, there are more and more chances for the woman to actually opt out of the religion. What does that mean? Because if you want to be liberated as woman, we think you can opt out of the religion and make the choices and it's not going to go against your value system. We think that's extremely precious in this debate because it means women have the freedom to choose over their lives and women have the freedom to opt out voluntarily from organized religion. That means they have lifestyle choices and that means therefore they are going to achieve true liberation. If your version of true liberation means no man is bigoted in the world, we think organized religion has nothing to do with your version of true liberation because of course there would never be a world where no man is bigoted. That's not the debate. Basically, if a woman has more choice and if a woman is able to pursue more life, we think basically that is what we mean by true liberation. And for these reasons, we are extremely proud to oppose. Thank you. And when religion is ultimately faith-based, 
And when it states that you must obey the true revealed word of the God and the creator of the universe, you don't get to make that decision if you're a true Christian. So you can be a good person, but a bad Christian by doing that. And that's where essentially this first clash starts. Because as my first speaker clearly stated, has been ignored throughout, is that all organized religions, the monotheistic Judaism and Abrahamic religions, have a doctrine. And as much as they will say, there's 6,000 times that it changed. There's so many versions, not a single example that has been produced in the case, what kind of mental gymnastics that you need to do to say that Corinthians 14, 34, says that you should shut up in front of your husbands doesn't really mean that. If you're talking about things like the Anglican Church, the Anglican Church was created because King George wanted to divorce and have sex with another woman. I don't think that's the exact example that you want to use. In every instance, the scripture is the word of God. And your religion indicates not what you think, but what the revealed word of God is what you should follow. If you don't, you go to hell. If you don't, you're not a Christian. The definitive characteristic of a Christian is when whether you believe in Christ. And when you believe in Christ, it means that you listen to Him, not what you do. Give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give back to God what belongs to God. The secular world does not matter. And please sit down. And if you think that you're a good person, fine. I'll opposition with, but you're not probably a good Christian if you keep on disobeying Timothy and the Thysians and Leviticus. If you keep on supporting gay rights. And you keep on speaking up in front of men. So the point of the matter is, you still need to think about this. She said that Pope Francis Chief, he also had to recant his statement that gays can go to heaven. He had to recant that an atheist can go to heaven because the scripture doesn't support it. The scripture slightly changes from the to thou to you, but it does not change the essential message that you as a woman are born from the image of man as man was born from the image of God and you are therefore subservient. The whole fourth chapter of the Quran states that women are inferior. How inferior? One third inferior and it tells you what kind of stick to beat your wife or what, how many lashes or what kind of increments. We don't think that a good person would do that, but we think a good Muslim would. And this is the essential difference of what organized religion does to you. It makes you that is divorced from culture and society. It is not a reflection of culture. It is the divine, natural, the supernatural reflection of the God that has nothing to do with the connections. And when you do, compromise what God said because you want to appease the secular constitution. You don't want to go to jail. You might be a good citizen. You're not a good Christian. This is why essentially under this motion, organized religion does not liberate women. Because the second point, is religion, organized religion, then pro-women? You have to be a feminist and not be a true Christian, or you need to be a true Christian and not be a feminist. Because when the Bible says that birth starts, a birth is a blessing, that life starts from conception, and this is where the Catholic Church says no to condoms, where it says no to abortion, then you need to make a choice. If I say I'm a proud feminist, and somebody shows you a scripture from the Bible, and say, is this the word of God? Yes, do you believe in it? She needs to make a choice. And if she's a Christian that's afraid to go to hell, she can't say, I can't speak in front of my husband, proud and clear, because it makes them compromise based on their identity. And like you said, I, I think I, that's wonderful. Leave. If you're a feminist, leave. You do have the option, but that's not where organized religion allows the liberation. It shows that you must leave if you want to be liberated. And that exactly proves our point. Please sit down. The other things that we want to talk about, you need to really think of the scriptures. So what scriptures are we talking about? You take a Christian feminist and you ask Matthew 5, 17. Did not Jesus say that he came not to obliterate the law of Moses, but to uphold it? And when Moses said that you could sell your daughters as slaves, don't you think that you have a conflict as a feminist? Don't you think that when Corinthians 14.34 says you can't speak up in front of men, don't you think there is a conflict if you have to listen to Jesus and you have to listen to your conscience? Don't you think that in Exodus 27 says that you can sell people and you can also take sex slaves? Isn't there a conflict? They say it doesn't happen anymore because you're a bad Christian by not following what Jesus and God told you, not because the religions are saying. And finally, this whole point where society will force religions to change. That is not religion, like we said again. That is a compromise. You're giving in. You are giving up on the word of God because you have to concede to the word of Richelieu. You have to give to the word of Socrates. You have to give to the enlightenment. That is not your religion. That is a watered-down 
withered, pathetic version of religion. And that's not true religion because you let philosophers take precedent over your God. But even still today, do we not fight on abortion? Do we not still fight on the matters of where women's rights are impeded? And who are the ones in the pickets in front of the Supreme Court shaking Leviticus verses? It is still the religious. And it will never stop until we get rid of religion where we truly would have the true liberation of all human beings, but exceptionally and especially women. Thank you. Oh, 
hope that this continuous change is unlikely to happen in the future as well, Madam Speaker. So you need to judge between who actually has proven their word of proof, Madam Speaker. So thank you. So they need to prove why patriarchy or dictatorship or oppression is inherent in the idea of believing in God and heaven, Madam Speaker. Because they seem to have a different definition of religion that has inherent values of patriarchy and oppression. We tell you that religion, the core of religion is the fact that you believe in the God that you believe in and you believe in the heaven that he has created. What they have to prove is why patriarchy is always, always inherent in that idea, Madam Speaker. We say it's not inherent in that idea. It was inherent in religion because the society was that way. But religion is changing along with the society and that idea isn't changing, Madam Speaker. So even if people are perfectly religious, they can succumb and submit to modernized values, Madam Speaker. We don't think the, the religion is changing or being pathetic and being becoming unreal, Madam Speaker. We think they're just changing within the values. The core value itself hasn't changed. We think that is that is what remains as an organized religion at the end of the day, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So, firstly, they haven't engaged anything for the major incentives of religion part, Madam Speaker. We told you, religions have a huge incentive to embrace the half of the population of the world into their, into their own religion, Madam Speaker, especially when there are different competing organized religions. It's inherent for the religion to have an incentive to gather more people to their religion. You said that's exactly why they're embracing the ideas that more people are submitting to, Madam Speaker. That's exactly why they're embracing the idea of democracy. That's, in, that's why they're embracing the, uh, the idea of women priests and whatnot. Because their inherent incentive is to have as much people as possible submit to their religion. They have to tell me why even in that inherent incentive, religion will never change. Religion will always block out women. Because in that way, those religions won't survive, Madam Speaker. Those religions that block out women, those religions that go directly against the social norms won't be able to survive because people will always do conflict between religious values and secular values and they will opt out of that religion and choose another organized religion that actually abides by, that actually better embraces their values, Madam Speaker. That's exactly why in order for organized religions to successfully or to successfully live through the generations, it needs to embrace certain ideas. And then they talk about oh, how organized religions, it's impossible to truly, women for truly actualize because of poop, which is a ridiculous point because poop is a symbolic figure anyway and it is changing. But secondly about the rigid in interpretation of the text and it's impossible for believers to question the text, Madam Speaker. They're simply lying because in the past maybe that was a better mechanism of controlling the believers maybe. Madam Speaker, in the past, maybe people weren't educated enough and there weren't enough scientific methods to actually go for the studies of the Bible. But in the current status quo, there are diverse fields of theology, diverse fields of scientific studies that actually do study about the word of the Bible, whether it really happened or not, or in which way that it has evolved through in this world, Madam Speaker. There are certain studies that question some of the words in the Bible and evolve through and interpret it differently in that case. So we think that in this, in this debate, we need to talk about which side has actually proven their burden of proof, Madam Speaker. We think that liberation of women can definitely happen with this continuous change of religions embracing their believers, religions changing, changing their interpretation of all their texts, and therefore we are very proud to...
they said organized religion is always patriarchal, is always against women, when they actually conceded to our ideas about how organized religions change it. Change. They simply said it used to be that way because that's how real religion looks like. The reason why they don't fulfill burden proof here is because they have a very narrowly defined way of looking at what real religion means and what real organized religion means, and they would never move out of that context and never really engage with what the opposition would like to bring you to. That we would like to bring you to the fact that in reality, organized religions look different way, but still they are organized religion because they are organized and institutionalized into certain organizations and in certain institutions, right? So they still keep the form of organized religion, but the but the things that they preach, but the things that they talk about, but the things that they pass on to their believers have massively changed. But they never really engaged to that point, but simply said, we are going to talk about real religion, and that is the end of our burden of truth. But we don't think so. Real religion, in your definition, might mean that, but that doesn't mean we win the debate, basically. Furthermore, they simply don't really tell us why only religion is exclusively doing this part, right? We gave you ma massive counter-narratives. You, maybe in less modernized societies, patriarchy was much stronger, and that's probably why religion submitted to these already pre-existing power structures. For example, religion do submit to pre-existing power structure if men are stronger than women in certain societies. But when we see women more liberated and women have like equal rights with men, say in Western liberal democracies, while we do of course have a long way to go for true liberation, but still when women do have more power, do have more economic power, do have more political power. We told you that the religion did adapt to this change in pre-existing power structure of society and therefore the exclusive harm of oppressing women was not really exclusive to organized religion itself but was something that patriarchy of or less modern societies have brought up to us but no response about this. So therefore we don't think they're really being exclusive of what they're arguing and they're not really doing the burden of proof right now, right? They, they throw shit tons of examples about coming from like middle ages coming from like 12th centuries, whatnot. But the problem is, if you, you are not the one to say that is the real religion that should only be debated within this debate, and we're never going to talk about how organized religion really looks like in the 21st century. So we think basically you're already losing this debate. Let's move on to the second reason why they cannot win this debate. We think basically they missed out on very key analyses of the opposition bench, and they were quite silent on those points. First of all, they never responded to the idea of how religion never wants to die out, and therefore the religion always has an incentive to, yes, like incorporate more believers and also interpret like Bibles in different ways because, yes, religion is always based on faith, but faith doesn't mean humans can always remain faithful just because that is how like the priest tell you. Humans are not like that. Humans are not like never questioning people or humans are not like never questioning like creatures to begin with. Humans are always thinking and humans are always having counter narratives. We told you, although while you might think that humans should always be faithful, we told you, yes, humans are faithful but at the same time they're questioning. And therefore, if they're questioning more and more, the religion has an incentive to incorporate these questioning people so that they don't die out from our society because the questions get too big and the faith gets too low. Furthermore, they never responded to my deputy leader of our opposition argumentation about how it is liberation can be achieved when the societies become more secular. Like for example, if it is more democratized and if it is more modernized, society becomes more secular. And in those societies, how women can opt out of those organized religions. If women opt out of those religions, that means women don't believe in the God's words that, that they talk about. And that means women are able to make free choices. Why isn't that liberation? Why do you never talk about the choice of women who opt out of the organized religion? So we think basically, when they're very, very silent on many of the points we talk about, and when they're not doing the burden of proof, we think basically we take this to my home. Thank you.
need to look at the Roman Catholic Church, these big organizations as to whether they can change. Their response is that some people may come out of these organizations and create their own little segment, right? But we think the burden on their side of the house is to show whether women's liberation is totally possible when it comes to the examples that we are currently dealing with. And that is something that we don't think they actually did. Because the opposition's case is extremely simple. They gave us two things. Number one, they have an incentive to change. And secondly, they gave us a number of examples. So let's look at that, right? Now, when we look into this, they keep on saying that the organized religions can change. But we clearly told you from our side of the house from the very beginning that with organized religion needs to be defined in the sense that these are the protectors of the text, protectors of the belief, following the word of God. And when they say that organized religion can simply, you know, change the word of God, delete it out of the text, that is an organized religion, Madam Speaker, because that goes to the very de define the very essence of what organized religion is, which is to protect the text. Uh, that is. And like when they talked about small minor changes, they never talked about changes in terms of the essence regarding women's rights. Those have never changed. As our speakers have continuously said, if there is any change, those changes were very minimal to begin with, related to you know, different types of words, which is why the essence of when it comes to women's rights, they never showed that change is happening when it comes to women. When, it, when they talk about secularism, when women are stoned to death, the reason why we don't respond to that point as much as they hope is because that's not because of organized religion, that's because of secularism, right? It's because society themselves have prevented them from doing that from the very beginning. So in that sense, we don't think they're fulfilling their burden. We think the opposition burden is very clear. It's not good enough for them to say that religion is changing somewhat. They need to show that religion will change to a point of total women's liberation, right? They need to prove that. That's their essential burden. So we're willing to concede that some change might happen because that we can still prove our burden under that model. And on that model, let's look into what they said. They said that because religions have an incentive to guard more religious followers, they will respond to change. But they never showed us why they would go to the extent of eliminating text, eliminating important phrases that are important for the very religious believers, right? They never showed us that. They never showed us how, when it comes to the women's text, these have ever changed, Madam Speaker, right? Because what we told you is they have the doctrine of the fallibility, which is why people are required to follow regardless, because this is the word of God. And in that sense, they wouldn't have that incentive to change. Now, let's look into whether things like abortion, right? Because they're not going to change their stance regarding abortion. And that's something that we continuously talked about. When it comes to, they're not going to say abortion is okay because that would go against killing life, right? So in that sense, they needed to prove that these kinds of elements would also change. But they never proved that. They only proved that Pope, for example, said, I'm kind of okay with gays. But Seth also responded that that was he recanted that. So all the changes that they talked about were enough to show that they were changing to, and will change to a point that it would lead to total liberation of women and a speaker. So when we go to the essence of today's debate, what we clearly showed you is organized religion has to protect the text. Organized religion has to protect the essential meaning of what it was back then. They can't simply change text whenever like their religious followers want them. And the moment they do that, they lose their essence of what it means to be an organized religion. That's why there are limitations in terms of changing the text in the way the religious followers want. That is why women's liberation can never be 100% satisfied. As long as we show you that it cannot be satisfied fully as the motion implies, we think we clearly showed you why it's impossible. Therefore, we take this.